Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order, please. Sarah, could you lead us in the line of acknowledgement, please? Yes, of course. As we enter into the splendor of fall, this school respectfully acknowledges that we are gathered on the ancestral lands and waters of the Algonquin people. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We also pay respect to all Indigenous people from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. Thank you. This Thursday, we recognize Orange Shirt Day and the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. All flags across our board will be lowered on September 30th in observance of the National Truth and Re Reconciliation Day. As a board, we are pleased last Friday to see the statement of apology by the Catholic Bishops of Canada to the Indigenous peoples of this land. As an education system, we know we have an important role to serve in truth and reconciliation. Tonight at our board meeting, many of us are wearing orange shirts or orange ribbons in advance of Thursday's recognition that will take place across all 83 of our schools. Father, I'd like to turn it over to you, please, and you lead some prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, be present at this meeting. We are privileged to have been given the responsibility to oversee the education of the students in our Catholic schools. Give us the courage to go to you in time of doubt. Give us the courage to be servants to the students and to those who serve in our schools. Give us the courage to respect one another with reverence and humility. Give us the courage to seek out and to find the solution to all of our problems. And give us the courage to be an example to the people we represent by the way we live our lives. And we ask you this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And we pray for our staff and students, extended family members, especially those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19. Minda Talane, housekeeper in the DE class at St. Luke Nepean School. Nora Grieb, a young student at Our Lady of Wisdom School. Her mother, Rosemary Grieb, is a library technician at Our Lady of Wisdom and St. Francis of Assisi Schools. Randall Scoosh, uncle of Sidney Anderson, teacher at All Saints High School and cousin to Peggy O'Mara, teacher at St. Gemma School. Hoda Marie Nassin, mother of Tanya Goder, teacher at St. Jerome School. <clears throat> Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> Father, can you highlight the same for October, please? Right. Yeah, for the month of October, we focus on St. Francis of Assisi after whom one of our elementary schools is named, and after whom our present Pope chose his name. He was born in 1182 into the family of Pietro Morriconi, who was a rich silk merchant of Italian origin, and Pica de Bourlemont, a noblewoman from Provence in France. He was baptized Giovanni, but his father started to call him Francesco. And indulged by his parents, Francis lived a high-spirited life typical of a wealthy young man. He was handsome, witty, gallant, and delighted in fine clothes. Around 1202, he joined a military expedition against Perugia, was taken captive, and spent a year as a captive. 
He turned his life around and began to care for the poor, sometimes with the money of his father, who became angry and disinherited him. He founded the Order of Friars Minor, known today as the Franciscans. In 1219, he went to Egypt in the hope of converting the Sultan during the Fifth Crusade. He returned to Italy and continued to live a simple life of poverty. He died on October 3rd, 2026, or 1226, and was beatified two years later in 1228. Known for his devotion to the Eucharist, and he was the first one to set up a Christmas crash. His feast day is on October 4th. He is also the patron saint of Italy and patron saints of animals and ecology. The school community keeps the spirit of St. Francis alive through their daily faith life. The prayer table at the entrance of their school reminds all who enter of their love for St. Francis and the care for creation. To celebrate their feast during these times, grade five and six students will lead a school-wide reflection on the life and virtues of St. Francis. As St. Francis cared for God's creation, the students at St. Francis School have a very impressive Echo School program. In keeping with St. Francis being the patron saint of animals, they regularly pray for their pets and care for them. They have a special prayer table where children place pictures of their pets. And during normal times, they also have an annual blessing of their pets, where they invite a parish priest to bless their pets after school. It is a lovely event that brings the community together. This month, is an opportunity for each of us to strive to live a humble life, seeing the dignity of every human being, especially those who are poor. This season is a wonderful time for us to be grateful for God's many blessings, especially the beauty of creation. That's it, Mark. Thank you very much, Father. Would everybody please stand for the National Anthem? Ka-ka-na-da. Yeah. 
if I may interrupt, Mr. Chair, it's uh, it's Superintendent Edwards. Apparently, there's a problem with the live stream out to the community. I am recording it, so I'm not sure if you want to wait a couple of minutes to see if you can get the live stream going, or if you want to continue, and then we'll post the recording afterwards. Uh, we, we can wait a couple of minutes, but we got a lot of business to deal with. Is it a quick fix? I'm not sure. I'll find out as quickly as I can. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, we've uh, we've got the the original link that was posted apparently is incorrect. The new link we're going to post on our website presently. Uh, it could take a few minutes though, but I am recording the video. Okay, we'll give you another minute or so, Mr. Chair. Does that mean we sign in again? No. No. Okay. We started. We started the meeting. Okay, thank you. We're on pause. Trust you more. Hello, just was wondering if we have delegations this evening. We do not. I'll be beginning in the meeting at 719. Okay, on to item C. There are no delegations. There is no public session. Can I have approval for the agenda, please? Trustee Warren, Trustee Curry. That the agenda for the regular board meeting of September 28th, 2021 be approved as presented. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. We have no school student department item profile. I have not received any uh, declarations of conflict of interest. Confirmation of the minutes of the regular board meeting of September 14th, 2021, please. Can I have a mover? Trustee McEwen. 
and Trustee Coburn. That the minutes for the regular board meeting of September 14, 2021 be adopted as presented. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. We have no unfinished business from previous meetings. We have no trustee motions. Item K1, presentation consideration of committee reports, committee of the whole. There's nothing to report. Mr. Vice Chair? Nothing to report at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, item K2, memo of the superintendent of special education and student services, re-SEAC re uh, membership representative nomination request. Uh, superintendent Benton, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am pleased to bring forward the uh, nomination from the Ontario Parents of Visually Impaired Children, nominating Dawn Pickering as their representative on SEAC. Ms. Pickering is a member in good standing with OVPIVIC, and we are happy to support this nomination. A copy of the nomination letter has been provided to the chairperson and the director of education. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Trustee Winter. Thank you, uh, Chair. Through you, just wanted to uh, say very supportive of uh, Dawn's nomination. Dawn's a constituent of mine in uh, Kitchissippi, and uh, her son, uh, Ollie, has gone through a very courageous time as a student uh, at uh, St. George. And, you know, I commend all the work that she has done both for her family uh, and continuing to do for the community. So it's, you know, with warm welcome that we uh, bring her on to the committee. Would you like to move the uh, motion? I'd be pleased to do so, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I have a seconder, please? Trustee Moore. Moved by Trustee Wood, it's seconded by Trustee Moore that the memorandum from the Superintendent of Special Education Services dated September 21st, 2021, and entitled Special Education Advisory Committee Membership Representative Nomination Request be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Superintendent Ben. Uh, memo, item K3, memo from the Superintendent of Finance Administration, read minutes of the Audit Committee meeting of uh, regular session, May 18th, 2021. Welcome, Thank Superintendent Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. These minutes are for receipt. Thank you. Questions or comments? A mover? Trustee Coburn, seconder. Let everybody jump at once. We have Trustee Coburn, seconded by Trustee Warren, that the memorandum from the Superintendent of Finance and Administration dated September 22nd, 2021, containing the May 18th, 2021 Audit Committee meeting minutes for the regular session be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item L1, presentation and consideration of staff or trustee reports. Re Memo from the Superintendent of Leading and Learning, re, re, Summer Institutes 2021. Welcome, Superintendent Keeley, Ms. Sargentson, and Ms. Trines. Welcome. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I am grateful for this opportunity to share with you the highlights of our Summer Institutes. Once again this year, the Leading and Learning Department provided a variety of professional development opportunities for all of our OCSB staff through our Summer Institute programming. I'm pleased to have the Summer Institute coordinators, Krista Sargentson and Alana Trines with me this evening to share some highlights of this year's successful programming. Thank you, Debbie. I am I'm happy to be here uh, and to share some of the information about the OCSB Summer Institutes with my co-chair, Alana Trines. We had a wonderful experience uh, and our um, Let's begin. So these are some of the statistics uh, coming out of the Summer Institutes. Uh, this year, we were very excited to extend the opportunity for all staff at the OCSB to facilitate a session at the Summer Institutes. We were able, therefore, to offer a total of 67 sessions over the course of six days that reflected a diversity of relevant topics. We had 1,392 registrants for the various sessions, um, and our sessions varied in length and format to provide access and accessibility. 
We were able to offer one hour virtual sessions. We were able to offer half day virtual sessions, half day in-person sessions and full day in-person sessions. Um, the diversity of sessions that we were able to offer really spoke to the outstanding resource bank that is the OCSB community. Uh, and it really speaks to the potential for that community to develop capacity in and of itself. Our feedback was overwhelmingly positive um, for both the in-person and the uh, virtual options for sessions. Um, we asked two main questions. The first one was, how relevant is this session to your role? And the second one was, how likely are you to use what you learned today in your role in the upcoming year? Um, people were very, very pleased with sessions. If anything, most people said that they wished there'd been time to have more. And good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see those of you that I've met before and nice to meet some of you who I haven't yet met. Um, so just to continue on from where Krista left off, uh, we were able to offer, obviously, both sessions virtually as well as in person. Um, and what was fantastic about that flexible model was that so many people um, from across the board uh, were able to participate where if sessions were strictly offered in person, um, perhaps they wouldn't have uh, had the opportunity to attend. So even um, teachers who were perhaps at the cottage or on vacation with the family this summer could still attend the summer institutes uh, virtually, um, even not being necessarily in town or, or close to Ottawa. Um, so that was really wonderful. We also covered a variety of topics, including kindergarten, um, LT, equity, reconciliation, um, mental health and wellness, and then some. Uh, and we also are very proud to say that all of the sessions were directly linked to deep learning, as well as the global competencies, or what some of you may know as the SIPs. Um, that was part of the application process for um, folks to be able to uh, apply to run a, um, or facilitate, sorry, a, a summer institute's program. So uh, they definitely were all linked. Um, another highlight of what we were able to offer this summer were spotlight speakers. Um, so not only does this speak to community connection and the fact that we're able to um, pull workshops and learning and education um, from outside of our OCSB family, um, but we also were able to offer um, very in-depth learning with regards to um, particular uh, subject focuses. And this year we really did um, focus in on equity and reconciliation. And we're proud to say that we offered some spotlight speaker series with Principal Kafale, as well as Dr. Nicole West Burns, who spoke to equity um, and anti-racist education. And uh, we also were able to um, book uh, Negan Sinclair, who is the son of uh, Justice, uh, former Justice Murray Sinclair, um, and he spoke to the critical role of teachers in reconciliation. So those were some really amazing highlights this summer uh, that we were able to offer for educators to uh, take part in. Um, and, and moving on to the strategic commitments and how these sessions um, meet up with uh, all of our strategic commitments throughout the board. With regards to Be Well, um, this strategic commitment uh, continues to be very popular. A lot of folks wanted to attend um, topics focusing around staff being able to support their own wellness, as well as student wellness, as well as wellness just for community in general. Um, so these two screenshots capture just a couple of comments that were available on social media um, with regards to uh, positive impacts that people experienced by attending some of these sessions, specifically uh, trauma-informed schools or classrooms, um, and also being able to participate in uh, workshops regarding mental health and how important uh, social emotional learning is. Also, when it comes to be community, um, there were a lot of opportunities for teachers to participate um, in be community sessions or sessions that revolved around uh, this idea of be community, this commitment of be community. 
Um, and so uh, we were able to, again, offer a workshop by Negan Sinclair. Um, and he definitely spoke to uh, how to do our best job with regards to reconciliation. And we were also able to offer a session to new and um, experienced NBE teachers. That's the new grade 11 English Indigenous Ed course. Um, and they were extremely well received. Uh, but going even beyond this uh, with regards to the community, um, it's not just about giving information, but it's also about people within the board being able to come together and share experiences in brave spaces. Um, and so B community isn't just about what folks are learning, but also what they're able to contribute in these sessions. With regards to being innovative, we are very innovative at the Summer Institutes. There were a number of sessions that explored a variety of ways to leverage board provided digital tools to offer deep learning opportunities and new and creative ways for students to demonstrate their learning. The two tools that you see highlighted on this screen are WeVideo, which is a video creation type uh, online uh, application that can be used for creating podcasts or videos or webcasts um, and it offers a really great way for kids to to demonstrate what they've learned the other one you see highlighted is a recently acquired uh, application called minecraft which you may have heard of um, and it is a really great way for kids to demonstrate lots of learning in different curriculum areas and absolutely to demonstrate their capacity for growing in the six C's. Um, these are some of the highlights of the comments that we gathered from participants. Um, I think they highlight the diversity of the sessions that were offered. We had people, lots of people reflecting uh, on the deep learning sessions using the language of deep learning. We had uh, people reflecting on how happy they were to have had the flexibility of attending sessions from home. Um, we were able to therefore extend that learning to people who may not have been able to attend and they were able to reach out to the facilitators directly to access recordings after the fact. Um, lots of sessions offered in terms of equity and kindness and anti-racism and relevant top topics like trauma-informed uh, pedagogy. So we had a really great time. Uh, we did so much learning. We are blown away by the capacity of staff at the OCSB, all staff at the OCSB, to provide all kinds of really relevant and current topics and uh, opportunities for us to come together to learn from each other. Um, I think that it's nice to have, it was really great to have been able to offer it to the uh, OCSB community beyond uh, just people who had previously facilitated a session or people who had been selected by, um, you know, their local school community um, out to the broader system, because I think it meant that we were able to capture a lot of different uh, talent and a lot of different perspectives and uh, a great diversity of topics. With Krista and I being new to the role this year, we are looking forward to continuing and offering some more workshops moving forward. So well, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. Questions or comments? Trustee Kerr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to uh, uh, Superintendent Keeley or, or Christo or, uh, or Lana, uh, um, I was wondering, uh, is it hard to get presenters or how do, you, how do you get them? Do you put out a call and then they respond or is it hard to get them or is it is there so many that you have to weed them out or how does it work? Maybe that's the optimum situation, but how does it work? You sort of re referred to it a bit, Krista, there in your last remarks, but uh, uh, how, how are the presenters uh, chosen and, and, and the topic? So I can speak to this for a moment, Alana, and then if you have something to add. Um, in previous years, facilitators were often um, 
asked or requested by their either their departments or their principals to become facilitators. Um, and this year, uh, we put an advertisement out in Board Business, which is um, the email system that would have sent a form out to the entire system to say, do you have a session that is about one of these deep learning competencies? Do you have a session that touches on one of these relevant issues? And if you do, um, please come forward and share your knowledge and offer these learning opportunities. And we didn't say no to anybody. We said yes to everybody this time. Oh, okay. Is there... Supplemental. A supplemental, and then Mr. Chair, thank you uh, through you to Krista or Alana. Um, have you know? Did you notice any uh, trends in who came forward? Were they mainly elementary uh, teachers, or secondary teachers, or long-time teachers, or new teachers, or or ones who had presented before? Or was there any trends that you noticed? Or uh, was that you just uh, didn't? Uh, so I'll speak to that through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so thankfully in our board, um, everyone is open to participating in the summer institutes. And so we were very lucky this year, I feel, um, in the fact that there weren't very many gaps that we were able to notice with regards to elementary or secondary or different kinds of topics to be covered. Um, if we had have noticed gaps like that, we certainly would have been able to then reach out to the appropriate channels and been able to um, get some other presenters and folks on board. Um, but there really aren't any particular trends in that sense. Um, we definitely had diversity from elementary to secondary, as well as across uh, multiple different uh, subject areas and topics. So we're thankful for that. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Okay, Trustee Lawrence, then Trustee Simpson, then Sarah and Ben. Trustee Lawrence. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, Krista, it's lovely to see you. I usually hear you on CBC Morning Show. Um, but I'm just blown away by uh, how many people participated, the topics, et cetera, et cetera. This program has certainly grown. And congratulations of this for the two of you is your first year coordinating this. I, I just think it's so valuable because the, the topics are, were relevant. And people during the year, especially in the past year and a half, possibly have not had time for tons of PD. And I know people I spoke to uh, said to me, oh, it's so nice and relaxing to sit at the cottage with my feet up and do this. So congratulations to you, and hopefully you'll be back next year. So thank you. Thank you. Jesse Simpson? Well, first of all, I do want to congratulate both of you also uh, on such an ambitious project as this was. As a former teacher, I want to do a do-over. I wanted to come to so many of these sessions. And so therein lies my question. If I'm a teacher that is, has wanted to go to a variety of questions and uh, sessions rather and missed out, is there an opportunity during the year to access some recordings so that I would be able to further my learning? Yes, I can speak to that. We. Um... We left it up to the facilitators as to whether or not they were comfortable recording their sessions. Of course, they would have asked their participants for permission to do that, et cetera. And if they weren't virtual, it may not have been quite as easy to do that. I know that there's some tech available now that might make that more exciting next year. But yes, we took those recordings and we took all of the session materials and we're uh, We've got them all compiled in the session overview map. So the beauty of the virtual piece is that if you did a recording, we can show it to you later. And so your summer institutes becomes something that is ongoing um, to continue to build capacity. And just to build on that, Chris, as well, if any trustees moving forward would like to attend any of the sessions, we definitely invite you and encourage you. It would be wonderful to have any, some, or all of you attend. Thank you. Sarah, then Ben. 
Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say that I think the topics were really well chosen, and I think that us as students really appreciate our staff learning about these topics as we learn about them too. So thank you for choosing them. Um, so I just wanted to ask in terms of learning technologies, if there might have been any focus on teaching in quadmester systems, since I know that learning like so much course material in such a short period of time can be pretty difficult to manage for both teachers and students. So if there might have been any strategies shared during any of those sessions. Sure, I can speak to that. And then Krista, you can add on because I know you're the tech person, but through you, Mr. Chair, um, there actually was a session specifically for uh, virtual education. Um, so folks who had been um, part, uh, who had been teaching their classes that way all year were able to now offer professional development sessions speaking to uh, best practices with regards to virtual education. So that's a great question. Thanks, Sarah. Good. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to second what Sarah said. Information was really put, well put together and was really informative, thank you. But my question is, can you um, walk me through the um, selection process for the topics of the in um, summer? Sorry, just find out. The summer sorry. institute, sorry. That's good. Um, so we actually, we put together a list of categories more to help us organize a schedule because we didn't want to overlap um, sessions that were on the same types of topics at the same time. We tried to make sure that they were staggered over the course of those six days. Um, and they included a number of the things that are right now relevant in, in our pedagogical practice and in current uh, reflective practice. Um, and so when people applied, they had to identify sort of which categories they might fall into uh, so that we could space them out appropriately and make sure that everyone had an opportunity to attend them. Is there any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, ladies, for your presentation. Obviously, there's lots of interest with it. Thank you. Can I have a move for the motion, please? Trustee Lawrence. Seconded by Trustee Simpson. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Leading and Learning dated September 22nd, 2021, entitled Summer Institutes 2021 be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item L2, memo from the Superintendent of Leading and Learning Re spiritual theme document 2021. Superintendent Keeley, Mark Solia, welcome. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to share with you an overview of the board's spiritual theme support document. This document was developed by our religious education and family life department, and this support document is an excellent resource for all staff to further engage and explore our new spiritual theme. Gratitude rooted in joy fills us with hope. This evening, our coordinator of religious education and family life, Mark Scholick, will be uh, presenting the highlights of year one of this support document. Thank you, Superintendent Keeley. Good evening, trustees, senior executive, and all members of the OCSB community in attendance. It's my great pleasure to present to you our next spiritual theme on behalf of our superintendent and the leading and learning department. When we begin our spiritual theme, we have our social media hashtag here for Twitter, which has received a lot of play since we have shared out our spiritual theme. We ground our spiritual theme in the message from the Holy Father that we root all that we do in gratitude. This is our starting point for this spiritual theme. The spiritual theme document was designed for all members of the OCSB community. There are bilingual resources that emphasize gratitude through prayer and reflection, action, servant leadership, and opportunities to look at various forms of media, such as books and film that reflect the theme of gratitude.
The scriptural passage from the epistle of James provided the inspiration for the next three years of our spiritual theme. It focuses our perspective of all the lessons learned from the challenging times and to be thankful for all the blessings that we have in life. The logo that was created has received a lot of positive feedback that has been applied in our schools in a variety of media, uh, some poster, some digital media, some done on canvas art, some stained glass that students have started to create reflecting our logo. We've seen that the aesthetic of the logo has brought about a very positive emotional response. In terms of our strategic commitments, we are grateful for to, to all members of the community. The experience and practice of gratitude we know promotes wellness spiritually, physically, and mentally. When we look at the term psyche, psyche is the representation of the soul. It's the essence of who we are. At times, it may be challenging to be grateful and to be thankful for the blessings that we have in life. But we look for innovative ways to move beyond some of the challenges that we have and look for the positive, that light in the darkness to bring us through to the next step. Since we have shared out our spiritual theme and the hashtag of OCSB gratitude, we've had schools show examples of how gratitude has been demonstrated and lived within the school communities. On the 21st of September, which was a week ago today, was World Gratitude Day. And we had, as a religious ed and family life department, put out a Twitter challenge looking for three photos to representing the things that we are grateful for in community, in terms of our wellness and uh, innovation. And the three examples here from St. Anne, St. George, and St. Isabel School. When we look at gratitude and its importance, sometimes we can't see the gifts and the blessings that are in front of us. These are the things that sometimes we do take for granted. We need to share what we have within because we can't give what we don't have. And sometimes when we don't have we have to lean on others who can help us with that. And this is how we live out our discipleship. This illustration of the virtual, virtuous cycle is meant to be fluid, that it's not a start and stop of the things that we are grateful for. We talk about muscle memory. We talk about institutional memory. The gratefulness that we show is part of our spiritual memory. And sometimes it needs a little prodding. The relationship of the uh, deep learning competencies with the new spiritual theme, when we look at showing gratitude for the experiences that we have and how we interact with each other, builds us as citizens, that we're part of something, that we're not bystanders to the things that are happening that we are active within it. In terms of our character, we look at the lessons that we learn from the people who helped to shape us, our community, our family, our friends, our staff, the collaboration that we experience, the richness that we receive from sharing our gifts with one another. We can always learn more from someone else. And we in turn have things that people can learn from us. In the critical thinking piece, sometimes finding gratitude in a situation requires us to be critical so that we can be that agent of change. We can promote that gratitude. And creatively, we know that when we are grateful, it can provide a calmness for us. And it's within that calmness that we can find the inspiration to do our discipleship. And the communication piece, conversation is the very food of the soul. Those opportunities that we have, and now that we're able to have 
some more interactions with each other face to face is filling us and filling the spirit. There's a variety of resources that we have in our support document. They are wide and vast and meant to be very engaging to all members of the community. It promotes the spiritual life of the OCSB. From the student waiting at the bus stop to the director of education and everyone else that helps and is a partner in the education of our students. And it's continuing to grow and develop. When we look at our spiritual theme moving forward for year and two, the virtues that we practice are scaffolded in one upon the next. We start with gratitude. That's the foundation. The Holy Father has emphasized to us many times that the two most important things that we have are service and gratitude. From that, we experience the joy and that gives us hope because we are a community of hope. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Questions or comments? Trustee Lawrence and then Trustee Moore. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mark, I hate to make this confession as a nun, but when I first saw all of this, I thought, oh, my God, in the midst of a pandemic. But, wow, what a wonderful choice. Um, gratitude and what I've been seeing on Twitter these past couple of weeks. And um, it, it is so appropriate. And it brings us back to what we need to hold on to, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, be glad to know I used it in a, a video message to the schools for Thanksgiving. So I think that the three-year theme is um, so poignant um, and reflective this year. So thank you. And to your department, I, I think it's wonderful. So I take back all my thoughts that I originally had because they don't hold weight in reality. So it was a learning experience. And I thank you for that. Mark, can I ask you to close the presentation, please? I can't see anybody's face. There we go. Thank you. Trustee Moore. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Mark, Shelly said it first. She said it well. She said it correctly. When I first saw this very long three-year theme, I was like, whoa, gratitude in the middle of a pandemic, whoa. But you picked it so well. I looked at your seventh slide, and that that second paragraph, just that the me-centered self-entitlement materialism, I don't think gratitude would have would have worked as well pre-pandemic. This is, this is like it was timed for you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Any other? Trustee Curry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mark. Uh, Mark, um, going forward, um, how how does uh, next year transition into joy? Is it is it do we will we be dealing with both gratitude and joy at the same time, or is joy built upon the gratitude? But it, do will we be dealing with it separately, or how does that uh, transition work? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Trustee Curry, one leads into the other, and they hold hands. The focus in next year, we we are still going to be looking at gratitude but our focus will be on joy, but not forgetting gratitude because you can't have one without the other. Okay, supplementary, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Jesse Curry. Uh, uh, and Mark, uh, what about the, the um, spiritual theme document? How has the take up been for it? Uh, have, have you got good feedback about it yet or is it too early to, uh, to give much of an assessment? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Trustee Curry, we've had fantastic feedback already. I know we're early into it and that the spiritual theme was uh, just released two weeks ago. We did a lot of teases with it. We know that the, the logo and the graphics and the message of it, um, very well received, uh, and it's coming to life within our school communities. Just taking a look at our Twitter feed for uh, at OCSBRE, 
just the amount of times that uh, OCSB gratitude is hashtagged, I'm surprised it's not one of the top trending things. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, I just wanted to agree with everything that was just said. I think this theme was really perfectly chosen for this year, and I think it'll be really important for students to be hearing as well. Um, but I just wanted to ask if there were any resources specifically that might be used to get this message um, to high school and middle school students, as well as to elementary school students, because I feel like as age grows, um, the need to care for mental health grows as well. So, yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, in the spiritual theme document, there are activities that go across all divisions and age ranges and grades. We do have some that are focused specifically for that division, be it junior, intermediate, or senior, or kindergarten. The mental health uh, piece of that, we the connection in between gratitude and overall wellness is been well documented uh, with our um, mental health leads within the board. They have integrated the spiritual theme into their documents as well. They can speak to that. Is there any other questions or comments? Thank you Thank for your time. Thank you for your presentation, Mark. You're welcome. Can I have a mover, please, to uh, move the motion? Trustee Lawrence, seconded by Trustee Moore. That the memorandum is from the Superintendent of Leading and Learning, dated September 22nd, 2021, entitled Spiritual Theme Document 2021, be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item L3, memo from the Superintendent of Finance and Administration. Read the financial statements for the 10 months ed ending uh, June 30th, 2021. Superintendent Shimmons, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the report in front of you um, is for the period, the interim period ended June 30th, 2021. Finance is currently working hard to finalize the actual August 31st, 2021 year end financial statements so that the auditors can come in and audit and we can present the actual year end to you in November. So you'll have to wait for that uh, particular final. In the interim, we do have these financial results up until the end of June which is virtually 100% of the year for many of the expenses related to schools. So staff, obviously, teaching staff, EAs, those types of uh, expenditures that finish up until the end of June. But then we do have other expenditures that do go over a 12-month period and run into July and August. So for those particular expenditures, we would expect that they would be approximately 83% spent at the end of June, which is, is 10 divided by 12 over the 12 month period. So when we look at the percentage compares um, down the right hand column for the 2021 year versus the prior year at the same time, it's a good indicator whether we're on budget and uh, if there's significant variances. That percentage compare, this method um, is very useful when you're comparing year over years as a tool when budgets, budgets and expenses are trending as expected. It falls short as a tool where we have periods of significant fluctuations, as we've seen during COVID for both the compares for 1920 and for the 2021 year, because we did have some lockdowns, we did have some significant uh, changes in expenditures and funding. So for example, um, when the budget was approved for the 21 year end, in August of 2020, um, not a few months later, we had an additional $16 million added to the budget, which is over 3% um, that came forward through ministry funding and through um, withdrawal from accumulated surplus reserves. So that's an example of a significant variance that makes some of these percentage comparators down the right-hand column very uh, much more difficult to, to um, to do the comparisons. But overall, from what we know has changed during the year, one example is this, the, the big shift last September where over 11,000 students moved to 
virtual schooling, which changed a great deal of expenditures. Um, keeping things like that in mind, reduction of PD during the year, reduction of mileage, uh, given these swings, the percentages that we're seeing looks reasonable. So if you look on your first summary report of the statement of operating activities, which gives the overall picture of our expenditures, our recovery of expenditures, and our other revenues for a final surplus deficit line, you will see in the budget column, it is reflecting a shortfall of 8,778,000. So the prior time that we would have seen this report, um, the board originally passed a budget of a shortfall of 4.4 million, but you'll recall also that last fall, the board did approve staff to use accumulated surplus reserves up until 2% of the operating budget in order to attend to the needs of the pandemic, uh, staffing for virtual school, et cetera. So that's what increased the overall budgeted shortfall to 8.778 million. Then if we look at the total in the actual column, you'll see that it's $29.5 million shortfall. So you might think that that would be what our overall operations are, but really this is reflecting of how we're spending our money, but not necessarily um, how it's coming in. So it's a cash flow perspective. And, and it's not unusual for us to be over at the end of June on this report because we, we process five pays for teachers in the month of June, and they do not receive paychecks in July and August. And with uh, salaries being a significant part of the budget, um, this can make a significant swing. So we pay that money or we pay that expense out up until the end of June. And then in July and August, we recover that cash flow from the ministry when they flow us our grants for student needs. So that's a big part of the reason why you would see that timing. In addition to the fact that we did budget to have an overall shortfall of $8.7 million. So it is reflective of what we would expect at this time. Um, there is a lot of variability amongst the budget lines. In particular, there was uh, significant expenditures as well on computer or technolo technological devices during the year, which you will see in some of the computer lines if you were looking in, in those particular lines. I think that gives the, the, the biggest impact, overall impact, for what we were seeing for the end of June, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Excellent report, no questions. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, Trustee Coburn, Trustee Curry. That the memorandum of the Superintendent of Finance Administration dated sep September 22nd 2020 entitled financial statements for the 10 months ended June 30th, 2021 be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item L4, memo from the Superintendent of Finance Administration, read bank borrowing bylaw 01, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this routine report comes to you annually. Um, in accordance with bylaw 13 and it, um, it, it sorry, comes to you annually. So the board receives 97% of its funding from grants for student needs, but the timing of when we receive this cash flow and when we actually make those expenditures don't always align. So for the example that I just gave in the previous report, at the end of June, we pay out five pays, but we don't receive the cash for that from the ministry until June and July. So therefore, there are particular times during the year where we might not have the, the funds available to fund the needs of when the expenditures are be, being spent. Similarly, we have um, purchasing cards in the system where there's a timing where we're actually borrowing by purchasing on the purchasing cards that we need a credit facility for. Um, capital projects, there's timing where we spend money and pay the bills for capital projects, but the ministry reimburses us twice per year. So all of those fluctuations during the year 
sometimes could potentially require a need for us to go into a borrowing position. Now, fortunately, during this past year, we were not required to dip into a borrowing position in our operating fund, um, but we got very close. And during COVID, when the government can change some guidelines on how they're, they're changing the cash flows to the board, it's important for us to have this uh, borrowing resolution should we need to draw on it. So this particular report gives staff permission to borrow to fund the operations and the capital as need be. Okay, any questions or comments? Trustee Curry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Superintendent Shimmons. I was just wondering, um, for the uh, bank borrowing, the limit is 70 million. How is that 70 million determined? It's, I guess it's almost 10% of our total budget, is it? I don't know, but is that how it's a percentage of the total budget or is there another uh, yardstick? Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. That's actually a, a very good question, Trustee Curry. Um, there's actually a process that we go through with the bank and the bank uh, verifies that process um, and a recommended amount. We had previously had bylaws of 60 million and it was increased a year or two ago up to 70 million for the needs that we're experiencing. So that's made up of 5.5 million for our summer payroll. We have 6 million um, for our letter of credit. So every time we have a construction project, we have to secure a letter of credit, which doesn't get released until all the um, work of the project is finalized. So we'll have debt outstanding for that. Our purchasing cards are $2 million. Um, our capital borrowing for capital projects is $26 million, And our COVID infrastructure is $14 million. So this brings us up into close to $60 million. However, we decided to maintain it with the $70 million because just in one change of a ministry policy in this past year, about how the education rates are being flowed between the municipality and the board. It swung our cash flow in June from the city by $10 million. So we decided that it would be best maintained at 70 million. Okay, uh, thank you. Chair, you're on mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. There's three readings for this bylaw to pass. There happens to be six trustees live and on the screen. So I've taken the liberty to write your names down so everybody's in there. So the first reading, moved by Trustee Coburn, seconded by Trustee Simpson, that bylaw 01-2021 a bylaw to authorize the borrowing up to $70 million be approved by the board. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Second reading that the bylaw, sorry, that the bylaw 0121 be approved by the board. I'm getting shorter as I go. Moved by Trustee Curry, second by Trustee Moore. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moved by Trustee McEwen, seconded by Trustee Lawrence. The third reading, the, the bylaw 0121-2021 be approved by the board. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Superintendent Chimmons, item L5, memo from the Superintendent of Finance Administration, read trustee honoraria for 2021-2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, the trustee honorarium for 2021-22 is a routine annual report that's before you for approval. Um, the key here is the calculations for the trustee honorarium have been made in accordance with the prescribed format. Um, that prescribed format was previously passed through a resolution by the board and in accordance with the regulations from the ministry on trustee honorarium. Um, if we look on the second page, you will see the adjustments um, from prior years that is based on enrollment. 
And while the enrollment growth that was projected was at 2.6% for the period of the regulation um, that it uses to calculate it, trustee honorarium only increased by 1.4% and not the 2.6% enrollment increase. The reason for this is because the enrollment percentage increase only is applied to the per pupil amounts and not to the base amounts. So the base amounts remain the same. So therefore the trustee honorarium increase for the upcoming year is $200 per trustee per year with the chair and vice chair receiving $256 per year and $228 per year respectively. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? I need a mover, please. Trustee Coburn, seconded by Trustee Simpson. That the memorandum from the Superintendent of Finance and Administration dated September 22nd, 2020, entitled Trustee Honoraria for 2021-22 be received, and that the following trustee honorary amounts for the period of December 1st, 2021 to November 30th, 2022 be approved. Chairperson, $20,955 per year. Vice Chair, $17,338 per year. And Trustee, $13,721 per year. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Continuing with Superintendent Shimmons, memo from the Superintendent of Finance Administration, re annual investment report for 2020-2021. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, the annual investment report is a routine annual report, but this time it's with a bit of a twist. So the report covers two items, um, the interest rate on the current or the operating account, and the second is the interest rate on long-term investments. So for the first part, the current account is the account that we use for our short-term cash flow and operating. Um, You'll see in the middle of the page, the rates that are applied to our daily consolidated balances. We earn interest in a tiered type interest rate. So for the first 10 million, um, we were earning at 0.7%, which is prime minus 1.75%. For the next 20 million at 0.8%. And for anything over 30 million, 0.85%. That's a change from the prior year when we were earning 2.35% as compared to that 0.85%. So obviously the interest rates went down significantly during the period of the pandemic and COVID. Um, overall, at August 31st, 2021, the account balance in the current account was $47.2 million, which was down $10 million from the same time last year. So in summary, the average interest rate went down by 1.5% during the year. The average bank balance went down by 10 million. And the interest revenue went from 930,000 in the prior year to 440,000 projected for the, well, almost final for the, for the August 31st, 21 year end. So that's a reduction of 491,000 on interest revenue in the budget for uh, the August 21 year end or a reduction of half a million dollars. So moving that forward to the current school year, the current budget year, uh, we expect to be seeing uh, a reduction of interest revenue continuing into the current year. So that is that is the current account. If we flip the page and we look at the um, summary of sinking fund investments, this is the portion of the report that is the long-term investments. And these are the investments that we are putting away for when the sinking fund comes due. And that sinking fund finally comes due March 22nd, 2022. So in a few months. And these are all these investments. If you look at the maturity uh, date on those investments, they're all January, February, March, uh, there's one December, so they're all going to be coming due between December and March of this year. We apply the last ministry grant of $2.7 million that we'll be receiving um, probably around Christmas, January, and we take that money 
and we pay off the debenture that comes due in a total amount of $31,000. So if you did pull out your calculator and you looked at, added up all the calculations of the interest rate that we would be making on that sinking fund, um, you'll see that we came slightly short on paying out that uh, particular investment. The targeted rate for that sinking fund investment would be to make at least two and a half percent on every debent or every bond that we invested at uh, the beginning of that schedule. You can see the yield to maturity. So the return that we were making was three percent, and then it dropped down to just under two, some a little bit over two, and then of course as we were approaching COVID and during COVID. Um, it dropped down to two and then 0.78%. So we will record a shortfall, um, write that off in the August 31, 2021 year of approximately 261,000. So that will be funded in that year end. And that debenture will be retired in March of 2022. And that is my report, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Trustee Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Superintendent Shimmons, uh, just two little things. One is um, you mentioned uh, as the um, amount of uh, investment funds grows, the, um, uh, the interest rate grows, although it's very minute. Um, I was wondering if it, once it goes over, like, say, 30 million and it's eight point whatever, does that interest rate apply to the whole 30 million or just to the money that is over the 30 million limit? Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. That's a very good question. I believe it's just the amount over the 30 million limit. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, thank you for that. And the other thing is uh, just with regard to the sinking fund, is it my understanding is that we, we're not going to have any more sinking funds because the province has uh, changed the way it's financing uh, new schools and stuff. Is that correct? Thank you for you, Mr. Chair. That's absolutely correct. So um, as of the year, year that was changed, and I can't pull that from my head, the ministry did move to financing the schools by debenturing it themselves as a province. So they cash flow us for... Uh, new schools or major capital. So this will be the last sinking fund that we will be entering into. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Is there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, can I have a mover, please? Uh, moved by Trustee Warren, seconded by Trustee Corbin. That the memorandum for the Superintendent of Finance and Administration dated September 22nd, 2020, entitled Annual Investment Report be received, and the investment strategy for both short-term and long sorry, short-term and sinking fund investments as presented above be approved. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item seven. Uh memo for the Superintendent of Finance Administration, re Austin School Startup 2021-2022 update. Superintendent Shimmons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the school startup for OSTA um, was, again, um, a bit more challenging startup, uh, similar to last year when COVID had us delayed on our startup into the month of September. Um, we did have some, some delays or cancelled routes in the startup for the current year. So when it became apparent there would be a, a shortage of drivers, um, OSTA looked at options to make sure or to endeavor to get all students on buses that were eligible for buses. Um, and they made revisions to the planning, which reduced 66 routes out of the system. So basically eliminating the need for 66 drivers. Um, and they moved more than 3,000 students from a yellow bus onto OC Transpo Presto passes so that uh, it reduces the impact of route shortages um, or canceled routes due to driver shortages. We are still experiencing canceled routes as of today. Um, we're showing that there's 27 routes that are unknown. 
um, but this situation is fluid. So the last tally that we had was we our board was experiencing approximately a thousand students who would be eligible for yellow bus transportation that wasn't able to access the yellow bus. Um, that being said, superintendents are working with school principals to determine how those students are affected for attending school or for accessing learning. And uh, for the large majority, the, the large part, most parents are able to get their children to school, albeit um, not without significant efforts. Um, they are finding ways for, the, for their kids to get to schools, either through OC transpo passes, carpooling, bikes, or other means. OSTA continues to look at options um, on how to get as many kids back on the bus who are eligible as possible. And as Vicki would say, even if this means onesies or twosies, so where they can free up a seat or two off of a yellow bus, it means one or two more students are able to access that transportation, um, in particular the ones in most need. They are assigning those routes based on a priority. So obviously they're, they're assigning the routes to um, where there's the greatest need. So rural areas where parents can't, or parents and students can't access OC Transpo, um, ensuring areas of low income communities are, access, are able to access yellow buses and prioritizing elementary, elementary students over secondary students. So that is their, their priority um, basis. They're also issuing single ride vouchers. So even at the elementary panel where parents can't get their, their children on a yellow bus, um, Austin is issuing uh, single ride tickets so that the parent can ride with their child to school and then have a ticket to ride home and, and do that a few times, a couple times a day as necessary if they don't have any other means to be able to transport their child to school. Where students are on those few instances where students have no other means of uh, attending school, so the superintendents are working with the principals to ensure that those kids have access to learning online to be able to continue with their learning. Looking at uh, the driver shortages, um, I think the easiest way to summarize it is there's no one reason for the shortages of drivers um, that are causing those canceled routes. There's no one reason and there's no one solution. But I can assure you, as well as the trustees that are part of the OSTA board meeting last night, every possible option, regardless of how um, unusual that option may be, is being looked at to try and resolve this situation. Um, on a forward-looking basis. Um, the critical item to remember though, when those options are looked at is students, student safety is paramount. So it's important that when we're looking at every option, be it all unusual or not, that we don't forfeit the safety of students because it's um, a very critical, uh, I, very critical, the students that we're transporting. Um, I think that gives an overview, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Trustee Moore. Thanks, uh, for you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the update. Uh, I know this year has been a challenging year for OSTA, um, also for the board in many different, uh, different ways. Um, so I've see, received a lot of feedback uh, for St. Joe's, especially for around buses. Um, everyone understands the challenges that's happening. But I think what, uh, what I think you guys have a hard time hearing me. Oh, let me just see if I can. Yeah, no, out. you're good. You're good now. There was somebody wasn't on mute. Oh, okay. You guys can hear me. Okay, perfect. Uh, so some of the feedback I'm getting from parents at St. Joe's, especially, is, is that they understand, um, they understand the issues that the OSTA is facing this year, um, but what they're having a hard time with is is the availability to get presto passes and uh, and to get um, stamps to get on the buses because I think as first St. Joe's was deemed as an area that couldn't uh, couldn't uh, 
have a safe, a safe busing route uh, for OC Transport, but we've since through conversations of deemed it safe uh, through RealCan. I think people are still having challenges though getting the accessibility to getting presto passes and what the criteria is around getting these passes and who qualifies for them. Um, so I think maybe, and I, I know the communication has been incredible uh, through uh, Austin. And they've done a great job reaching out to people, but I think people are having a hard time getting answers and people are getting frustrated easily because of it. And people are used to the last year kind of virtual uh, online learning and stuff. So there's a lot of challenges that are kind of um, coupling on top of each other. But I think the biggest one right now that I'm hearing is just the availability for uh, cluster passes and, and the criteria around that. Thank you. Let's try Trustee Moore again. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Superintendent Chairman, uh, the buses have been a big problem in the West End, as you well know. We've had our city councillors involved. And as we heard yesterday at the regional meeting, it's a problem all across eastern Ontario. So is there something that maybe we could ask Austa to come out with a statement so that we can take it to our trustee association and as another way to let the government know about the transportation that they need to be putting the money in or what they, whatever they need to do, but so that we have the right words and what exactly Austin needs so that we can, we can try and ask for that. Thank you. Trustee Coburn. You're on mute, Brent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so with regards to the shortage, I think one of the messages that needs to be sent out is Austin doesn't hire the drivers, right? The different bus companies hire the drivers and people don't seem to understand that. That's not to say Austin isn't responsible for transportation, but they're not responsible for hiring the drivers. I guess, so, so that's a comment. My question is, so we've moved... Uh, I know a number of students onto public transportation, OC Transport or LRT, and is it seems to be a system when it's working that seems underutilized. My question is, and I know it's not as simple as moving all the people we can't transport on the yellow buses off to that. Is there more capacity to move our students onto public transportation, OC Transport? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Trustee Coburn, that's that's an excellent question, and it's a question that we've raised to Asta to see if there is continues to be capacity. Um, that capacity would have to be worked with OC Transpo staff in order to design those routes and to um, potentially change the timing, put more routes on. So the, the response that I received back when asking that is they're continuing to work with OC Transpo and they work very closely with OC, OC Transpo. Um, one of our new staff over at Asta actually came from there. So obviously they have uh, knowledge and, and working relationships with them. So they are working very closely with them in order to move whoever they can over onto those transportation routes. Where it becomes complex is a driver will do, a driver will have a bus, but do a few different runs, so a few different schools. And if we move, say, a third of the kids that they transport over to OC Transpo and then replace that with a third of elementary kids, um, sometimes the, the, the route becomes so complex that the driver just says, not worth it, I'm not doing it, and now you've lost two other school runs. So those are the types of things they're trying to balance and juggle because right now the drivers um, are looking at how complex the runs are and what the workload is and the split shifts and what's involved. Um, so they continue to look at that, but an answer to your question is there will be, there's likely a few, but not enough to solve all of the, the shortages right now. Thank you. Does anyone else have a first question before I go to Sandra's uh, second question? Trustee Moore. Thank you. I was wondering if Austin has any information about the areas of our city that don't pay a transit levy, our rural areas. 
and if they're willing to, because of this unprecedented problems um, use ask OC transport to go out go out into those areas or make some sort of a deal to do that sort of thing if they're working on that at all would be my question thank you through mr chair um, that is information that we can rely relay on to asta um, as one of the options there's there's a long list of various options as I mentioned there's, there's no one cause and no one solution to it. So we will add that and I'll go forward that through. Trustee Warren. Thanks, uh, through Mr. Chair. Uh, two part question. One is if if we switched over to using OC Transport as a means of transportation, is there a cost variance between per person when it comes to you providing a Presto Pass versus hiring a bus. And the second part of the question is, is it possible for future years to be proactive in the future, like starting now, to offer either taking a bus or press the pass for students in advance so you can predict what the next school year is. If 90% if of the people prefer to take a press the pass and ride the school bus, that would alleviate, that could alleviate some of our busing issues in the future. It's just uh, as an option because it seems like this is going to be a nothing that's going to be solved quickly, um, but OC Transport will be there, especially with the light rail coming and and old, old train and all that sort of stuff. The means of transportation is there. Can we utilize that for future use rather than just depending on it for emergency situations? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. So the first question is, is a Presto Pass costing us more than a yellow bus? The answer to that is yes. So with moving uh, the more than 3,000 students over to the Presto Passes um, in order to try and reduce the number of students without transportation, it actually has absorbed all of the, um, I don't like to say cost savings, but the reductions in expenses for those, those routes that are canceled are not being paid obviously because they're not doing the service. So that has absorbed that entirely and still hasn't provided service to all students. So if all students were on Presto, our budget would be significantly higher for transportation. Um, offering it out in future years and as, as an advanced option, that's something that uh, can be looked at because Osto is looking for obviously in immediate solutions, um, as well as looking at long-term solutions. So that is something that uh, that we can add to the list. Um, some of the other things that they're looking on the list is eligibility for transportation. Uh, we do know that there, there potentially will be a new funding model announced in the current year by the ministry. So if that has some changes to eligibility, that would be something that would also be, be reviewed. Um, in addition, you know, the public often comments about empty buses um, and that situations where people are keeping a seat um, as an insurance policy, um, but not necessarily using that seat while there's other kids out there that can't get on a bus. So um, doing a review of who's actually using those buses and if parents are not using the seats, bring that up for a student that, that needs that transportation that isn't currently um, with a seat. So there's various options to look at, but uh, definitely as a long-term solution, we'll pass that on to Austin. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Curry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, more in the vein of a couple of comments. One is that uh, I think uh, the folks at Austin are are from what I see and from how uh, they respond to my uh, inquiries, uh, doing all they can to try to uh, free up more buses and more drivers to be able to accommodate the routes. And the other comment I would have is that, to me, this is, transportation is very much uh, uh, a fairness thing. You have students who are, 16 and 20 kilometers away from a school who don't have busing. And then you have uh, students who are say four kilometers away 
and they have busing. And it's very hard to explain to a parent who calls you saying that they pay taxes and why are they not getting busing when someone so much closer uh, is getting busing. So I think it's a really uh, a matter that we really have to deal with, especially on the rural routes. I agree with their prioritizing uh, the rural routes because uh, really the yellow buses are the only way that, uh, that uh, these students have to get to their schools. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will say that this was brought up uh, with the minister's call uh, on, uh, on Monday. And I will say that it has been brought to OCSCA's attention to the circumstances in Ottawa. Is there any other questions or comments? Can I have a mover, please? Trustee McEwen? Seconded by? Trustee Warren? That's the memorandum from the Superintendent of Finance and Administration dated September 22nd, 2021, entitled OSTA School Startup 2021-22 Update Be Received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much, Superintendent Simmons. Item L8, memo from the Associate Director of Education, re staff and visitor COVID-19 mandatory testing and vaccination policy. Associate Director Donahue, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? I know I was having difficulty with my sound earlier today. That's great. I'm getting a thumbs up. So um, as you know from my memo, there is a link in my memo to the staff and visitor COVID-19 mandatory testing and vaccination policy. So I would like to start by saying that uh, at this point, we have approximately 93% of all of our staff vaccinated. So that's very good news. Um, the memo and the policy in front of you uh, is based on lots of input. So we have received information from the Ministry of Education. We have a legal opinion. Uh, we've also consulted with yourselves, the trustees and all of our union and employee groups, our parents groups, et cetera. So my purpose this evening is to highlight a few of the uh, items from the policy, and then of course I'd be happy to answer any questions. So I'd like to start with our unvac unvaccinated staff. So for unvaccinated staff who would either have a medical exemption or a human rights code uh, exemption, uh, these employees do need to be tested regularly. So that is indicated in the policy. It's two times per week. And this is the medical information we have received through the Ministry of Education. If any of our employees refuse to be tested, uh, there would be a few options. The first would be an unpaid leave. And then we would need to go to disciplinary and that could uh, lead up to termination. For our staff who are unvaccinated, as I mentioned, through a medical exemption or through an exemption uh, from a code protected right, uh, then we also could offer administrative transfers. Uh, and so this might be the case where we know we have a staff or student who is particularly vulnerable and we know that we have a staff member who is unvaccinated. And so we may do an administrative transfer to, to, to move them to another work locations. As I mentioned earlier, there would be frequent testing the two times per week. And we'll also have those staff wearing additional protective, uh, personal protective equipment. So in addition to the mandatory medical grade mask, there could be face protection and other equipment. Um, if I look at the um, volunteers who are also mentioned in this policy, for our volunteers, uh, they must be fully vaccinated. So uh, there really isn't the option other than obviously for a medical exemption. And then we would go back to the testing that is also being used, the mandatory twice per week testing for our staff. Um, I believe, Mr. Chair, that those are the highlights that I have for my notes. But as I mentioned earlier, I'd be happy at this time to answer any questions that the trustees may have. Thank you very much. Trustee Moore. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm getting fast on that hand button. Uh, <laughs> Associate Director Donahue, I want to say thank you to you, your staff and parents, unions, everyone who's looked at this policy. It's a lot of hard work that's got in, gone on in a couple of weeks. And it reads wonderfully. Thank you very much for all, all your work. 
Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I do have the pleasure of presenting this policy. And though, although I did have a bit of editing work that I did, and I did collect a little bit of input, really all the thanks should go to our director. He he did most of the work on this, and so I do thank him for that. So I would share the thanks uh, with our director. Trustee Coburn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the policy. Uh, although my preference is a mandatory vaccination policy, I think this is a good policy. I think it balances uh, a number of different factions with regards to the policy. I do have one, and I don't normally do this, I do have one sort of uh, wordsmithing comment. If I look at the policy under section one, it, it identifies in the second sentence that the purpose of this mandatory vaccination policy. So as I read the title of the policy, it's a mandatory testing and vaccination policy. So is was that intentional or is that a misnomer? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think we could uh, change the wording there. I think it is a very good catch. I think what the trustee is saying is the purpose of this, instead of saying mandatory vaccination policy, we should say staff and visitor mandatory testing and vaccination policy. Repeat the title, if that's what the trustee uh, is indicating. That's what I would suggest. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to uh, see if there's any, through you, Mr. Chair, if there's any other people that need to make a comment about that. Trustee Warren. You're on mute, uh, Spencer. Oh, sorry, I was scratching my neck. <laughs> no questions on my part. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Curry and Trustee McEwen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to um, Associate Director Donahue. Um, has the, uh, those who don't, uh, aren't vaccinated and are being tested, they have to uh, watch or uh, a compulsory education video. Is that video been prepared yet by the province? Do we have that? Uh, are people watching it? Is it impactful or not? Thanks. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the trustee's question, we have recently received the education module from the Ministry of Education. I have personally not looked at it yet, so I can't comment if, uh, if we're seeing any uh, uptake from it, uh, but we have received it and uh, we are now sending it to staff who are unvaccinated who need to watch that. Oh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Trustee McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the um, Associate uh, Director Donaghy. Um, the t just the testing, um, what do our, uh, what are we doing now with testing for staff that are not vaccinated? Are they, so, I know you're testing twice a week, but where are the tests coming from? Who gets them? That sort of thing. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, in the absence of a past policy, we are following the Ministry of Education direction. And the Ministry of Education direction is that unvaccinated staff uh, must do a rapid antigen test twice per week. Uh, I believe we're recommending, we're telling our staff Sunday and Wednesday um, and the rapid antigen tests they have received. So the Ministry of Education did deliver them to our board office. Our human resources department uh, made sure that those were uh, distributed in a confidential manner. And those employees, it's all done through our human resources department. Those employees must not only do the rapid antigen test, but submit their results uh, through an app provided uh, through the Ministry of Education from a, from a company that's providing that. And that is monitored by our human resources staff. Uh, we have a, a, a not a number, a very small number of staff that look after that. And so that is currently in place. Um, the procedure will be able to continue if this policy is passed. Is there any other questions? Trustee Lawrence? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Associate Director Donahue, I missed the last part of um, your sentence. Oh, sure, no problem. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, if I can remember what that sentence was, is that our unvaccinated staff, 
they have a supply of rapid antigen tests at home. They must do the test on themselves twice per week, and they must upload the results to an app. Um, I think it's called Thrive uh, that our human resources department has access to and that the human resources staff check that twice per week, our unvaccinated staff have negative results. Obviously, if they have positive results, then there's a there's a different uh, path that is followed in terms of testing and follow up. Thank you, uh, Madam Associate. Trustee Coburn. Uh, Brian, you're on mute. And excuse me. Uh, first of all, I'll say that 93% is an excellent number. Um, I noticed on our website that there's 434 employees who have not yet submitted the attestation. If the policy passes tonight, and it sounds like it will, how long will they have to submit that attestation? And as a supplemental, if they don't submit the attestation, uh, what are the uh, what will the results of or what what are the actions that will be, uh, I guess, uh, provided if they don't submit the attestation? So without checking the policy, I can answer the second question, and then I may refer to the superintendent of HR or our director to help me with the first, so I don't have to search through. But to the trustee's second question, for, un or for staff who do not attest to whether or not they are vaccinated, we will treat them as unvaccinated. And I believe, I don't have at my fingertips which part of the policy that is, but I believe we state that in the policy. So any unvaccinated staff will be treated as, sorry, any staff who do not attest to their vaccination status will be treated as unvaccinated. Um, and then I think the other part of the question was, I forget, I apologize. Maybe someone can help me out on that. The other part of the question was, if the policy is passed tonight, how long do they have to submit their attestation? And I see my colleague, uh, Superintendent McCabe, online, so I do not have to look it up. I'll refer to him to answer that question. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have in the policy indicated they, ha they have until uh, the 8th of October to submit uh, antigen testing. So if they don't by that time, then we would uh, proceed with what's it written in the policy. Um, if I could take one more second and just add, I, I, I don't um, know if everybody is aware, but we have excellent cooperation with our community colleges and universities who are supporting us in ensuring that uh, all those who are coming to us are doubly vaccinated. So we're grateful for that support. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? I will say when I, I was I read this in uh, agenda planning, uh, I was impressed that the amount of detail and I think it covers all the questions the trustees have discussed. So um, I'd like to thank on behalf of the board uh, all those that worked on it. And with that, I'll call the question. Can I get a mover, please? Trustee Curry, seconded by Just Trustee Moore. That the memorandum from the Associate Director of Education dated September 21st, 2021, and entitled Staff and Visitor COVID-19 Mandatory Testing and Vaccination Policy be received, and the board approve the following policy, Staff and Visitor Mandatory Testing and Vaccination Policy as amended. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We have no new business. We have no notice of motions. Confirmation of the action report of September 14th, 2021. Can I get a mover, please? Trustee Warren, seconded by. Trustee Coburn. That the action report covering the period September 14th, 2021 be received. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Inquiries, administrative announcements, Mr. Director. Uh, none today, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Adjournment, what time is it? 8.48. That the regular board meeting of September 28, 2021 be adjourned at 8.48 p.m. All in favor? I'm oh, sorry, Trustee McEwen, do you have a question? 
No, I was just going to move it. Just, oops. I need a mover you. Thanks very much. No problem. Can I have a seconder, please? Trustee Simpson. Move my trustee McEwen, second my trustee Simpson. <clears throat> trustee Simpson. That the regular board meeting of September 28, 2021 be adjourned at 8.48 p.m. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. Done in an exped expeditious way as, as usual.